Well, here we are in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And uh, I want to re read the first three verses to you. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, notice something very interesting. The word gifts is in italics. Do you see that? Make sure you see it's in italics because it's not in the original text. Is your Bible show it that way? Or they, or they may have left it out. Did they leave it out? No, does it look just like the word spiritual? Well, it's okay, I suppose, but it's not in the original text. But listen to me, it's in the context. See, the context is chapter 12, 13, and 14. And there's no way you could read chapters 12, 13, and 14 and not know that Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. So the writer, when the English came along to explain it, they put gifts there because that is what the subject is, even though it's not in verse 1. And if you have a good translation, a good study Bible, they would have put it in italics or put it in the footnote of 12.1. Did you look in the footnote of 12.1? Did they say gifts? Yeah. A good one will explain it, that it's not an original text. It's in the context. They, the more you study the Bible, the more you become familiar with the word context. You never take text out of context. Okay, so <clears throat> that's important. So when he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Unaware. Now, it's not underwear. I was teaching this with a group of uh, high school kids one day, and they all get giggled at that. And I said, what is so funny? And they said, it sounds like underwear. And I went, oh, my goodness. Now, every time I read that, I think that. Isn't that crazy? Now you will. Welcome to the club. <laughs> now you will. I hope not. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, that's vocative of who's being addressed. That's every believer. Listen, listen to the word brethren. Adelphos, listen to this word brethren. Listen to me. We're all brethren, even if we're girls. Not, not if we're girls. <laughs> no, no, I ain't gonna care. Brethren is r the family of God. We're all brothers in Christ. We're family. We the, the word should be we're all family in Christ. W doesn't matter whether you're yellow, red, black, and white, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It does not matter. This is a title that Paul gives to every church age believer. It's one of your status, privileges, identity in Christ. You are part of the royal family of God, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. We're called the brethren, meaning that God is our father spiritually. He's our daddy. You know, he's our Abba father, pater. And so he uses the vocative address brethren. I do not want you to be unaware. The word unaware is ignorant. It is the word ignorant. And next week, I'm going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about it today. I'm going to talk about what that means. It does not mean, in the King James, they use the word ignorant. They tried, to, they tried to translate it a little bit lighter, unaware, and they didn't do a good job with it. Next week, I'll explain the word. It, it means without no, it, it's the word, it's got the alpha privative on the front of it, and the word gnosis. And it means without knowledge, without gnosis knowledge. It means without knowledge. Um, and then he's going to explain in 2 and 3 a problem they're having that, because he's writing to answer problems. He says, you know, you know. That means they have been taught and taught and taught. Or, as William says, 10 times and I get it. But it's probably true with a lot of us on a lot of subjects. Uh, ten times. You know you've been well taught. They, and they, you know who their pastors were? Paul and Apollos. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 3. He talks about these two great pastors they had in there of the word of God. You know. That's, you know because you've been well taught and you 
have brought it to a place of where it's now faith in your life. You know that when you were pagans, that is, unbelievers outside the realm of the hope in Christ, Gentiles, not Jews, who were inside the realm of hope of Messiah, but outside the realm of Messiah. They were pagans. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have the teachings of the word of God. They weren't custodians of the word of God evangelism like the Jews. You know that when you were pagans or heathens, you were led astray to dumb idols, dumb idols, dumb. They, the, the, the devil would tell them they can speak and give you prophetic messages, but they couldn't. Because they actually, idolatry is actually demonic activity. You know that when you were heathens, pagans, you were led astray to dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you must be born again to have the reality of what the gospel means, your identity with Christ. Your identity with Christ. You must be born again. All right? So I'm going to look at verse 1 today. That's the what I'm after, and then because verse 2, 2 and 3 talks about without knowledge. Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. And he's going to talk about in the rest of the chapter 12, 13 and 14, he's going to talk about the problems that were in the church. The problem, And one of them was the conflict the spirit of the world versus the spirit of God. The spirit of the world speaking one language and the spirit of God speaking another. One cosmos diabolicus, the other divine viewpoint. And there's conflict in that. What the world says is true and what the Bible says is true is often very much in conflict in the way you think. They're always in conflict, but maybe not in the way you think, but you're in conflict once you understand what God says. This is the mind viewpoint about that which is not. So we'll talk about that next week. The entire church program, at least ours, the entire church program was designed, the church, the entire church program, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, the entire program of the church of Jesus Christ is designed to function off from two very important doctrines, spiritual gifts and spiritual growth. Spiritual gift and spiritual growth. And these have to be in conjunction in your life. It's not just the knowledge of spiritual growth. It's not just the knowledge, the gnosis. It's not just the gnosis about spiritual gifts. It's just not that you have the knowledge of spiritual gifts. But you have to have the application of them into your life. It's not enough to have an arm. The arm has to work for the body. Feeds, it waves. It pushes, it pulls. Every, every person is a member of the body. Every born-again person is a member of a local body. The body has a spiritual gift, which is its identity. It's its identity in the body of Christ. An eye, a leg, an ear. Paul talks about it in chapter 12. And there's no such thing as an ungifted person. Every believer, every believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ in the church age has a spiritual gift. It's called a spiritual gifted ministry in the body of Christ. And it's as important to the body of Christ as your eye, your ear, your mouth, your arm, your foot. That's just the visible parts of you. Your heart, your lung, the invisible parts is as well. And so spiritual gifts. If you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have a spiritual gift. It was given to you at the point of salvation. The question is, what is it? So let me have a word of prayer. Now I'm going to get into my study. We're going to take a look at an introduction on the, the 2020 spiritual gift. I do this every year, by the way. Let's pray. I give you a mode of science to believe a priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to make confession of sin in order for the Holy Spirit to teach you truth. 
truth that will set you free from the cosmic system of lies about the things of God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful, Father, for the freedom to stand and preach the gospel without being intimidated by a legal system that would try to shut us down. I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, for positive volition that come our way to study the truth of the word of God, a truth that will set us free from the cosmic system of lies that will introduce us to the absolute truth of divine viewpoint thinking and application to our life where we can become actively engaged in the work of God through the local church. We pray, Father, today that this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to show you some scriptures. <clears throat> Remember, there are three major passages that list spiritual gifts. They list them. <clears throat> Romans 12, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, and Ephesians 4. If you study those passages, you will see that spiritual gifts are listed. You can write them down. When you write them all down and compare them, you're going to wind up with 19. In other words, they're, they're, some, they're going to be repeated, and when they are, you go like, well, I already have that on my list. You'll find there are 19. You'll find 19 because pastor, teacher is one in this, that pastor is the office of a teacher. A teacher can hold the office of pastor. There is no gift listed in any of these places called pastor except in Ephesians and it has a hyphen. There's a lot more to it in the Greek, but that's enough. In the past, you might have heard that the hyphen means that this is one and the same. It's not true. The hyphen could mean that, but it doesn't have to. Once again, it's whether the word pastor is the word shepherd. The word pastor is the word shepherd. When, he, when Jesus was talking to, his, to Peter, he said, shepherd my sheep, feed my sheep, do this, do that. <laughs> being a farm boy, being a farm boy, went to college to leave the farm. <laughs> my only way out, because I wasn't an athlete, my only way out of the farm was to get an education. But I learned something that helped me in the pastorate about shepherding or farming or working with cattle. Whatever you feed in the, the front part of it, you clean up in the back part. That's called pastoring. That may not make sense to you, but if you've ever had an animal, you must know that. Whoever caretakes them has that two problems. If you live in a city, then you may have to hire someone to be a scooper. You take your dog for a walk. You may have to have somebody not walk your dog, but walk the scooper. You do understand what I'm saying. I don't want to get more graphic than that. That's called shepherding. <laughs> That's called pastoring. And... Uh, Whether you want to be a pastor or not, that's what goes with the territory. So in Romans 12 through 14, a list of gifts. In Romans 12, a list of gifts. In Romans 4, these are the three great passages on the listing of gifts. <clears throat> now, what Paul made very clear in chapters 12, 13, and 14 is that spiritual gifts and spiritual growth go together. You get a gift has nothing to do with your growth. It has to do with your salvation. Your gift goes with your salvation. But for that gift to be functional, what Paul is going to teach in 12, 13, and 14, you can have knowledge of the gifts and not have the function. That when it comes to the function, it can create all kinds of problems because you don't have the maturity of growth to deal with it. That's chapter 12, 13, and 14, by, by the way. We will certainly study that as we go through there. 
whatever problems they were having in the Corinthian church, and they were having a lot of problems, every growing church does. Every growing church. Every growing church. If you're growing in the word of God, it's conflicting with issues in your life that are cosmic driven. They're worldly driven. You're full of anxiety and you're full of insecurity and you have all of these issues that come in conflict with the word of God that says be stable, be patient, be kind, settle down, don't worry. And then this comes in conflict in your life. And if you don't resolve it, you get stuck in your spiritual growth. And when you do, then you get stuck in the application of your gifts, the function of your gifts properly. That's how all this works. And Paul is going to explain that. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1.7, Paul said, so that you are not, listen, he says, you are not lacking in any gifts. You know what else he said? He said to the Corinthian church, you've got the gifts. That's not your problem. Your problem is the function of them. And he's going to address all these problems of function. It's not knowledge. It is, it is the absence of the knowledge of the function, not the knowledge of that you have gifts. They knew they had gifts. They were aware they had gifts. And they weren't functioning problem. And because they weren't functioning problem, they had problems to resolve that they couldn't do. So they all wrote to Paul and said, what are we doing? We got problems. How do we fix these problems? And Paul writes back, chapter 12, 13, and 14, to fix the problems. It was a problem of function, not a problem of knowing about the gifts. They knew about the gifts. They were having problems in the function of it. You are not lacking in any gift. Now watch the second thing he says. You miss it. See, you miss it. Now watch what he says. Don't miss this. Awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he means by that? He means the second coming. The revelation of Jesus Christ is his second coming, which we call the rapture. Do you know what he just told you? Listen to me, church. This is important. He just told you that your spiritual gift is essentially important until Jesus comes back. The whole church age is about the function of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. Think about that. And then think, why is it that you don't know what your gift is when it was a gift of salvation? When we get through this study, you will know it. If you desire to know it. Because this is not a secret. You don't have to be at any spiritual level. A baby believer can know his gift. Got to study it. I mean, how do you learn the alphabet? You think you're born with it? No, you're born with the opportunity of it. You got to learn it. If you learn the alphabet, a lot of wonderful things happen. Words. Words are conversation. A whole lot of good things come from the alphabet. It's basic, though. If you don't learn the alphabet, you can't get anywhere with it. Knowledge that you have the gift is one thing. Knowing what the gift is another. The spiritual maturity and responsibility now falls upon on your shoulders. And so it's important. And listen, it's important to tell us that spiritual gifts, the subject Paul's talking about, he says spiritual gifts are important to the church existence until the second coming of Christ. It's the, it is the church program until Christ returns, spiritual gifts. People say, Rod, why do you teach it every year to teach us spiritual gifts? It's the program of the church. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 11 through 13. And I emphasize some things to you. Listen to this. One and the same Spirit, Holy Spirit, works. 
all these things. What's he talking about? Spiritual gifts. What works spiritual gifts? The Holy Spirit. They're not, they're not for the flesh. They don't work in the flesh. They, they're given by the Spirit and operate by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit distributes the gift and he functions a gift in your life. The Holy, their gift is not going to function in the flesh, only in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not for carnal, it's for spiritual people. The one and same Spirit works all these things. You know what he's talking about? Function. He distributes the gift identity, and then he works all of these things, means the function. The distributing and the function of your spiritual gift is in the power of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit works the gift. I mean, how dependent should you be with your gift exercising itself, functioning only, it will only function, he does the work or the work doesn't get done. It is the one and same Holy Spirit in all of us who works all these things, distributing to each one individually, point of salvation, just, watch this, just as he wills, not your. Listen, you ought to draw a little line out from his will and say, not mine. Your gift is not your choice. It's been chosen for you. So get off your high horse about what you think I will do and what I won't do. Listen, it is not your will. And boy, I tell you, he will choke you down on it. I said, okay, I got a communication gift. Okay, I got a teacher gift, but I'm not going to pastor. Boy, you don't talk to him that way. Believe me when I tell you, you don't talk that way to him. He will grab you by the throat. Metaphorically speaking. If you think you're going to do it your way, that's flesh. You do it his way. It is his will. He gave you the gift. He works that gift, and he works it according to the master plan of God. And listen, you need to surrender to his will. He'll do it his way. And it's not good to stand in his way when it's God's will. I'm just telling you, I've been there. This is not a good place to be. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, and that one body is Christ. And what's that mean? Well, I got an arm laying over here, and I got a foot over here, and I got this part over here, and I got a part over here, and I got a part over here. How many parts you got, Ron? Oh, <laughs> about 30. I, I, get, I got a part here. I got a, part, I got, I got a lot of parts. So you, how, how, do you, how do you find out if it's one person or several? How do, you, how do you do that? You got all these parts. Is there a way to figure it out? Yeah, you look at DNA. Right? You match up the DNA. And you come up, you say, one person, only one person died right here, and we know who it is. Same DNA. Jesus Christ. Say, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not even about your gift. Your gift is only one part of the body of Christ. It's not the body. The whole body is based on the Savior. But when I look at the limb, I look at the arm, I look at the fingers, I look at the eye, I look at the ear, they all have the same DNA. What is the DNA, Ron? Jesus Christ. Come on, church. If you think you can just take your arm and go do what you want, you're so out of it, you're so out of it, What do you think about that? <laughs> the, 
This is what he said. We are one body, although we're many parts. We're one body, and that one body is Jesus Christ. We are one body, and that body is Jesus Christ. By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, Gentile, whether slave or free, we were all baptized, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Do you know what he's talking about? Drink of one spirit? Let me tell you. John 7, 37 through 39. Because he said, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit, John teaching, he said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be like an artesian well within you, springing up waters of everlasting life. And many will come to that fountain to drink. The woman at the well did. The woman at the well did. Did she get a drink of the eternal water? And did it satisfy her? And did it change her life in a dramatic way? Come on. See, he's prepped us for this. You see, we all have the same well. We all have the Holy Spirit as a gift from our salvation because we live under the new covenant in the church age. We all have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and he is that artesian well where thirsty people can come and take a drink by grace. Because it represents who and why Jesus Christ is so important to our life. Same well. We all got the same well. And there's enough to, listen, there's enough to meet the need of every thirsty person your life will ever touch. And everybody in this room, everybody in this room that believes that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, every person out there that listened through with us by the internet or Facebook or however you get caught up with us today, I speak this to your life. It's true for you. The Holy Spirit indwelling you in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Jesus said when he comes, he will be that well for thirsty, not only for yourself. You will never go thirsty yourself. Once he's there, it will be for you and it will be as many as can come. Your life touches a lot of needy people for Christ. A lot of needy people for Christ. Your life and mine. We are the mobile unit of the church, aren't we? We're the mobile unit. That's what I think. Here's what he says in Ephesians 4, 12, and 13, one of those passages. When Paul gets into a discussion on spiritual gifts that go from 9 to 16 in chapter 4 of Ephesians, he said, for spiritual gifts are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The word service is the word ministry. I say that your spiritual gift is a gifted ministry to the church and through the church. Equipping. Your spiritual gift is equipping you for the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a spiritually mature man in Christ to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, which is super grace status. <laughs> and your spiritual gift is a key is a key element to bring that package to the world who are hungry and in need for Jesus Christ. Your spiritual gift. Isn't that interesting? Equipping the saints for the work of ministry. I would have never in my life imagined that my spiritual gift 
would have taken me on a journey that my life has had in the work of ministry. This little kid from Podunk, Michigan, I have seen it all. I, I have seen it all. I've had a view of Christianity in my lifetime that overwhelms my soul that God would choose to put me in the circles he's put me in in my lifetime. My life is long from being over. My ministry is long from being over. My ministry is just started. People say, well, you've been at that church 45. My ministry has just started. I'm a slow guy. I'm a slow starter. I agree with that. I can't speak for your life. I can only speak for my own. But what a whirlwind life I've had in Christ. What, how well he has equipped me, not by my, but not by my might, but by his grace to be part of the things my life has been a part of in the bigger picture of Christianity in America is just overwhelming. It just overwhelms me. So let's, let's look at a few things this morning before I go take a break. <laughs> I know it's a long introduction. Some people say, you know, your induction's a whole, le- introduction's a whole lesson. I know it, and I don't know why. But here's what you got to learn about the book of 1 Corinthians. If you learn this about 1 Corinthians, it will help you teach it. The entire contents of 1 Corinthians based on four sources once you know that, it's going, to be the, it's going to be the most fun book for you to study because you now realize you've got four sections on which you can teach from. And here are the four sources of the content, contents of the book of 1 Corinthians. For example, chapters 1 and 4 is from Cleo is the source. Chapter 1, verse 11, Cleo. Cleo is the source of chapters 1 through 4. Chapters 5 and 6 comes from the leaders of the church at Corinth. They're the source. Now, I want you to write something down on your paper. Say, I got, chap- I got 5, 1. Then I got 16. John Dyer... Thank God for John. He catches my mistakes that I don't. See that 16? Should have 16 verse 17. And in chapter 16 verse 17, Paul mentions three of the leaders by name. The second source are the leaders of the church, chapters 5 and 6, three of them, are identified by name in chapter 16, verse 17. Our passage, ours comes from congregational questions mentioned in 7.1. That covers chapters 7 through 15. And then Paul closes the book in chapter 16, verse 1, with his personal ministry matters for prayer. And he talks about his plans and need for prayer. That's chapter 16. That's the book of 1 Corinthians. And when it helps you understand the sources, it helps you study the book and teach it. Now, there's a lot of things that need to be answered in this book of 1 Corinthians. It's an enormous book. But you see, spiritual gifts is chapters 12, 13, and 14. Of chapters 7 through 15. This is only one part of the bigger picture of what Paul is talking to, the congregation. 
had questions. And he, he's trying to doctrinally answer them. We're dealing with only one of the many questions. Are you, do you understand? Spiritual gifts. The function of spiritual gifts. So he discusses them, and then he talks about how to deal with the problems. Chapter 12, 13, and 14. That's our subject matter. That's our subject matter of my morning. The second thing is 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul answers specific questions from the congregation of the Corinth church regarding spiritual gifts. Okay? And he does it in chapter 1, verse 1, when he writes, Now for the matter you wrote about. And they're questions. They ask questions. These are congregational questions. In chapter 7 through 15, it involves a lot of questions from the congregation of which spiritual gifts is only one part of this congregational asking questions about specific issues. We're only dealing with one part. Point number three. That's important you know that. Point number three. Paul opened his discussion of spiritual gifts by a specific phrase, do not miss this. Do not miss this special phrase. He uses a special phrase, and every time he uses that special phrase, he's changing the subject. He's going to change the subject. He's going to change the subject. He does it in chapter 12, verse 1. Now... Uh, or in, uh, yeah, chapter 12, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, notice gifts is not in text, 12, 1, but it's in the context. Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now concerning. He's going to use that phrase to change the subject matter of the questions asked. For example, he does it in chapter 7, verse 1, I'm going to answer the things about which you wrote. <clears throat> and he does it again in chapter 7, in verse 25. Then he does it in chapter 8, verse 1. He does it again in chapter 12, 1. That's in my section of study. And then he's going to come back and do it in his final statement in chapter 16, 1. You see, in my section of study, chapter 7 through 15, he uses it in chapter 7, 1. 725, 8, 1, and 12, 1. See, in my section, it's a very important phrase because he's changing subject about which they wanted to know. He's changing subject matter. I know. This is called the introduction. I know. I know. That's what separates our church from other churches. We're not fast food. We're set down and eat and dine. That's what separates. People say, well, what separates you, Ron, from the rest of the churches? Most of them are fast food. We're not. We sit down and look at it, explain it, build a case, a doctrinal case for your life for application. I'm just telling you what it is. Now, here's another thing. He doesn't use the word gift in chapter 12, verse 1, but he does do something really important. He uses the definite article ton, T-O-N, and he uses a specially designed word for spiritual, pneumatikas. 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 Pneumatikas became a prominent doctrinal term with the Advent ministry of the Holy Spirit, beginning with Pentecost in 30 A.D. and going through the book of Acts, which is a transitional period, changes of covenants, changes of dispensations, all these changes, changes of priesthood, changes of, of uh, canonization, all these changes, there were like ten, ma ten major changes from divine agencies, Jewish age to church age, divine agency uh, of Israel to the church. 
See, that's, that's the transition. The book of Acts is the transitional period that began in Pentecost. This word became a pro prominent doctrinal term, term with the advent ministry of the Holy Spirit beginning at Pentecost in 30 AD and, and working its way through the book of Acts. This word is not found in the Septuagint. It is not found in the four Gospels, although John records the teachings of Jesus on the advent of the Holy Spirit in John 7, 37 through 39, and in John 14, 15, and 16. <clears throat> but doesn't use that word. This word is dynamite for the new covenant and the church age. This word spiritual, this word spiritual is dynamite. It is dynamite. See the I-K-O-S? Look, look at, look at that word up there. See the I-K-O-S? That's a suffix to the word spirit. Pneuma is the word spirit. Spiritual, spirit. I-K-O-S is a suffix, and it means belonging to whatever the word is. It's the tail of what? Is it the tail of a cat? Is it, see, it's on the end. Is it the tail of a cat, a dog, a horse, a cow? You think it's not important that we know? <laughs> well, well, if we're going to identify what's the tail, you know, the tail that wags the dog or the dog that wags the tail, well, isn't it important to know? I-K-O-S is the tail. The tail of what? Numa. In other words, this subject that I'm going to discuss, i.e. spiritual gifts, belong to the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts belong to the Holy Spirit, and therefore they're called spiritual. And he uses a unique phrase for it. He uses the definite article ton, meaning we're talking about, and he's introduced a new subject. He did it in 7-1, 7-25, 8-1, and now 12-1, now concerning... He used a definite article to introduce the new subject, which is spiritual gifts. And they all belong to the Holy Spirit. He distributes them and he functions them. It's all about him. Now here's something else he does. In John 16, 7, when Jesus is talking, introducing them to the advent of the Holy Spirit, he says, I tell you the truth. Now, you always pay attention to that. I tell you and tell you and tell you this. Pay attention when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, or he says something like, I tell you the truth. Now, Jesus Christ can only tell you the truth, so why is he saying that? Everything he spoke was truth. When, when it came out of Jesus' mouth, it came out of the mouth of God. God, God, God can only speak truth. He can't lie. It's against his character. So why does he ever say, I tell you the truth? Because it's something so out there and important to your life, you must not miss it. And here's what it is. It is to your advantage that I go away. They were all mourning. They were crying all the time because he said, I've got to go. Where are you going? You can't come. Not now. Later. And when he would say, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to crucify me, I'm going to be buried, three days later I'm going to rise from the dead, oh, quit saying that stuff, hey, you're different, depressing me. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, quit whining about it, it's to your advantage I go away. It is to your advantage I go away. The helper will not come to you, but if I go... I will send him to you. How is it possible that this was a landmark issue with Jesus Christ and you don't give a hoot about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life? You don't pay enough attention to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You live so much in the flesh. How is it possible that you miss the dynamics of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life? How is that possible? It was the key message as Jesus left this world. Here's the message. 
It is to your advantage I go away. If I don't go away, he won't come. And listen, that's everything because I'm going away and he's coming. You got to get on board. Do you understand that? Dear hearts, do you understand that? Why is it so difficult you to be consistently walking in the power of the Holy Spirit when that's where the, all the power comes from? There's no power in you. It's no willpower. It's not energy power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You spend so much time in the flesh and such little time in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's got to quit. You whine and cry over the goofiest stuff. That if you actually got it, it would hurt you. The word paracletus is an interesting word. In the Hebrew, I wrote it in the Hebrew. See that? Menachem, Menachem. You see, I wrote it on your paper. See, it says Hebrew. See that? Here's what you don't know. The word paracletus, that's the Hebrew word. And you know what the Hebrew word? The Hebrew word was a title for Jesus Christ in the Old Covenant. I wish I had time this morning to go into depth with this. What, what time is it? That clock back there. It, it can't, is it 10 to 10? It's what? Billy, time just flew by, didn't it? I wish I had time to talk about this, but listen, write this down. Write this down, because I know I didn't, I didn't put it. It's the title of Jesus, and listen, it's recorded in a messianic place, Psalm 69, 20 and 21. I didn't put it on your paper. I thought I'd be able to do a little study. What do I know? Psalm 69, 20, 21. Listen to me. Listen to me. It's used in John 19, verses 28 through 30. It was a title of Jesus Christ, like the Lamb of God. A title, a title connected to Jesus Christ, like the Lamb of God, the mediator, intercessory, advocate, another comforter, Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the word advocate is paracletus. What a wonderful... What a, well, I don't have time to go any further. I've run out of time. <laughs> My introduction was too long. Ran out of time. Well, I wrote it on your paper, though. I wrote it on your paper. I would encourage you to go back and study that. One day I'll come back. I'll come back and do a study with you on this Messianic title in the Old Testament. Oh, it is a wonderful study. <laughs> oh, it is so good. Paracletus, who would have ever thought the Paracletus when he said another comforter, the Alas, the Alas Paracletus, another comforter in John 14, 15, he said, another comforter, an Alas, another the same coin. The Hebrew understood it. In the Hebrew language, they knew that there would be an, another one like Christ whoa, another one like Christ? What does he mean, another one like Christ? And he says, it is the Holy Spirit. John later says, whoa, and he writes about it. John goes, whoa, and he writes about it. <laughs> well, Father, we thank you for this first hour. Oh, Father, we just don't have enough time. We got so much energy and we've got so much to say and we got so little time to say it. Oh, Father. Father, Father. I pray, Father, we would be students of the Word of God because it is the Word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It just brings things together so sweetly in our life. It gives us the joy of the journey. Even when we go to a hospital, it is the joy of the journey.
the Holy Spirit lights up the place. It lights up the room. It lights up our souls. We're here for ministry. Oh, Father. Father, Father. We thank you, Father, for these who give. They give so faithfully, Father, as you give to them so faithfully. I pray we would be great students of this, great stu stewards of it as a board of leaders. Be honorable with your money as we are with your time. In Jesus' name.